I wish in life that it was as easy as just that decision. But what I want you to actually choose in this moment is not that you're gonna change your mind. It's not that you're gonna change your mood. It's that you are going to change your mind and your mood as many times as necessary to become the person you wanna be. Hello guys. Welcome to part two. <laughs> if you are jumping into today's episode and you didn't listen to yesterday's episode, let's take a quick pause. Let's take a beat on this one. Go back and listen to part one of this conversation on mood, how we change our mood, how we can control our mood, how we can affect our mindset and how it pertains to mood, all the things in part one. I explained essentially why I believe most people, and this includes a past version of myself, don't understand that we are in control of our moods. And so because we don't understand that we're in control of them, then we don't know that we can change them. So part one digs into why this happens, how we have practiced this behavior, how there are certain seasons where it feels impossible to affect the way that you feel, but that once you sort of stand in this truth and take ownership of your experience, your whole life can change. So that's part one. And then part two is today, where I want to talk about very specific things that you can do inside of each and every day that can help you to take control of your mood. I got six ideas here. These are all things that have been really helpful for me. And I think hope that they'll be something that you dig too. So that's what we're going to talk about today. But make sure you have listened to part one before we jump into part two. I would love to start this conversation by establishing why I believe I'm a great person to coach you on your mood and your mindset. Yeah, I think let's start with just the level of crap that I have lived through in my life. And that includes childhood, teenage years, early adulthood, the last decade, I have experienced incredible trauma. I have experienced the highest highs. I have experienced the lowest lows. I have had private failures, very public failures. I've felt really good. I felt really bad. I've been all over the place in my life. And I think when I really start to look at all the things that I've lived through, even I sometimes feel like kind of shocked that I'm not just in the floor, in the fetal position, unable to to get back up. Every once in a while, I'll tell my fiance, like I'll tell him a story about my childhood or something that happened and he'll just look at me like, you know, someone's looking at you and you know that they're like, it's like you're an alien because you've just told a story that is very normal in your family. Like no one in your family would think that was weird, but someone who had a healthier family life would see the story <laughs> you just told as like, you're from Mars. Like you just said something that was so crazy. I know some of you are probably chuckling or nodding along. Like you got a family like that too, or you've lived through stuff like that too. I like to establish that not as something I want to dwell inside of, but to tell you that it's why I believe that it's a choice. And I know not everybody does. I know lots of people would love to argue. In fact, I, I talked about that a bit in part one, that lots of people would love to argue for their right to feel the way that they do. And the bottom line is, of course, you get to feel the way that you do. If you want to go through life feeling angry, feeling sad, feeling bitter, frustrated, cheated, ignored, less than, small, like if you want to go through life feeling any suffering emotions, that's your right. We all get to do whatever we want with this life that we have. Mary Oliver asked us, what would we do with our one precious life? And if you want to spend your one precious life being pissed off at your ex-wife, who you divorced 
32 years ago. It seems ridiculous to me. It seems like a waste of some pretty great stuff. But if you want to spend your life that way, that's your that's your journey. That's what you get to do with this lifetime. But don't blame her. Don't blame society. Don't blame God. Don't blame anybody else for the way that you're feeling because that's something that you choose to exist inside of. If I only get one chance at this, I want to do everything I can to live well. And to me, living well It's not about how much money you make or the car that you drive or the place that you live. Living well is about living with joy and with purpose and going to bed at the end of the day and feeling like you did a good job. And most days I get there. Some days I don't. Absolutely. Some days I'm like, oh, I, you know, door dashed burritos again. That's what I fed my kids for dinner because I was too (laughs) tired to make something nice, but like, okay, at least we all sat around the table together and I did pull out the cloth napkins even though we were eating burritos. Like, I don't end every day feeling like I knocked it out of the park, but I do have inside of each and every day mostly good feelings, mostly good feelings. And that's taken a lot of work. Like so much work, so much practice. The the amount of time I've spent, especially over the last four and a half years of training my mind to not dwell on negative things, it has taken everything. Like it is a part, it is my part-time job is focusing mindset. And I found myself needing to do that because, you know, I was born, despite the family I was born into or the life that I had as a kid, I have always been sort of bright-eyed and bushy-tailed. I have always been that way. I've always been optimistic. I've always been, since I was little, excited for life. I was always the kid that talked too much. Everyone was telling me to be quiet, like I had a big mouth. I couldn't stop asking questions. I do it all the time with my fiance, like it's early in the morning and no one's had their coffee and I'm just like, like, oh, what about this? And what about that? And what I'm just excited. I did it. I had to take my oldest son. He had a flat tire today. And yes, I could have taught him how to change a flat. But honestly, I just didn't know. I just didn't have that in my heart. So I called AAA and before AAA came, I just took Jackson to school And on the way to school, I was just jabbering and talking and, you know, college applications in the summer and I'm talking, talking, talking. And I realize, I mean, he's 17. He doesn't have coffee. So like he is not awake enough for the level of energy that I'm bringing to this car. And I was kind of laughing because I was thinking, my gosh, like I do this to everybody. I've always been that way. But about five years ago, my hormones were really unbalanced I've talked about this a ton, so, you know, you can go listen to past episodes, but my hormones were really out of balance, and for the first time, I was experiencing really extreme, very negative emotions that I felt like I could not control, and I did a ton of work to figure out how to deal with that, change my life, change my nutrition, supplements, worked with doctors, did all the things, but it's still has been a process of learning how to feel better. And it does take a ton, a ton of effort. I want to say that for anybody who you maybe hear this conversation and you're like, oh, easy for you to say. Like, it's so easy for you to say that we can control our thoughts and that because we can control our thoughts, we can control the way we feel. It might be easy for me to say. It's not easy for me to do. It has taken a ton of effort and none of my progress was fast, which is really hard for me. I'm the kind of person I like to see results quickly. I want to make a change, you know, that fast and then I want everything to line up and fall into place and feel really good and it didn't. It was very slow 
And sometimes it has felt like between balancing hormones and like mental health, it has felt like one step forward and two steps back and three steps sideways and then do the Watusi. And, you know, now it's the we're living on Tulsa time and it's a grapevine to the left. And it just it's been all over the place. I'm really seeing just incredible traction in the last year. And what I realize, I'm noticing it a lot in the last year. And I realize that what I'm noticing is not a sudden like, oh, you know, everything all of a sudden is just moving forward and I feel so much better. What I'm seeing is like one tiny inch of traction stacked on top of the next, stacked on top of the next. Like they were such micro movements in the right direction that I couldn't really feel any big change. But all of a sudden, now looking back, if I look back to where I was five years ago, I don't even recognize that person. I I literally look at pictures of myself five years ago and I'm like, I don't even know who that was. Like just so unhealthy in spirit when I look at those pictures I'm just like oh my god I was so unhealthy in my spirit I, I just was so depleted in my soul I absolutely was just following the rules being a good girl doing what they told me to do making all of these decisions experiencing incredible worldly success but inside just dying slowly just drowning in anxiety, not living life the way that I wanted to live it. Uh, just It's just a different person. And it has been a very slow process. I guess I want to say that in case any of you today feel like you've been working at this for a long time and you've been trying to get your mind right, you're trying to get your heart right, trying to get your focus clear, you're trying to get your health in check, and it just feels like nothing's happening, even though you're doing all the right things. It's just a much slower process than we would like it to be. And it's because we are seeking to reverse decades of practicing something else. When I tell you that I'm a good person to coach you on this, I say that because I live a very happy life, not every day, not like, you know, ecstatic and everything's perfect or I don't get stressed out. Of course, those things happen. But I live a very happy life because of simple things. I really just dwell in very simple pleasures and I think I always kind of had this as part of my upbringing. I, you know, it was very close to my paternal grandparents. And I think in a lot of ways, they sort of moved very slowly. They were in their slow girl era, you know, back in the 80s. Like <laughs> they just did things slow. They sat outside in nature. My grandpa whittled. My grandma, you know, br- like just like it. she gardened. She grew roses. They just they moved very slowly. And I really was taught to appreciate a lot of those things from them. So I had that kind of in my upbringing. And then that was kind of gone with, you know, chasing success and trying to be this and that and like trying to raise kids and having babies and doing all these things. Like there's so much wrapped up in that that you forget what actually matters at least what I think actually matters are are simple things. It's the relationships you have with people you love. It's how good you feel in your own skin. It's do you love yourself? Do you have joy inside of each and every day? Do you laugh? Do you, you know, experience pleasure inside of each and every day? I do. And I don't always nail it, but I feel like I've got some ideas that can make your life feel better, I hope. I have nothing to sell you. I, I I always get nervous when I'm saying something and it sounds like I'm leading up to like, and you could take this course for $10,000. Nope, just, just some ideas, just some things that help me and I think might help you too. So that's what I wanna talk about today. How do you change your mood? Whether you are, you know, super 
angry and you've been that way for a very long time or whether you're tired of being scared all the time. You're tired of being so shy. You're tired of worrying about what other people think about you. You're just you're just freaking over it and you want to make change. Like that's about changing your mindset. That's about changing your vibration. That's about raising yourself to a higher level. So let's talk about how we do that. The first thing that you can do to change your mood and mindset, and this is going to sound super obvious. I was going to, yeah, this is going to sound super obvious because most of my advice is very simple. It's not easy to do because you're changing patterns of behavior, but it is very simple because the simple stuff is what works. It has worked in time memoriam. It will work going forward. Even if robots take over the world, like this is always going to work. The first thing that you can do to change your mood is decide to. That's where we're starting. That's the first thing you have to do is decide that you want to make change. It is so obvious, but not a lot of people do it. I reference this book a lot called The Dip, which is by Seth Godin. And the book is all about when people find themselves in this slump between, you know, they started a job and they really loved it, but now they don't love it so much anymore and they're trying to decide should they stick with it. Or, you know, maybe it's the same with a relationship. It was so great when we got together and now it's like kind of boring and the spark isn't there. And they're like, should I keep going? Should I quit? Like, what should I do? And Seth, freaking genius, says, you know, most people give themselves two options when they find themselves in this space of being unhappy with where they are. They say either I'm going to quit doing the thing that I'm going to do or I'm going to keep on trucking. But Seth says the opposite of quitting isn't to continue to do the same thing. The opposite of quitting is recommitting with passion. Recommitting with passion is the opposite of quitting. So you're maybe thinking, yeah, I don't really, you know, I don't really want to keep being this person. I don't want to keep having these moods. So you're just like, I'm just going to keep on trucking and like know that I probably shouldn't be so harsh to myself all the time, or I probably shouldn't lose my temper and scream at people in traffic. Like I probably shouldn't do that, but you don't really do anything to make change. The opposite of quitting isn't just to do the same thing with the idea that it should be different. The opposite of quitting is you actually doing something. It's you making a choice. And the choice needs to be like before and after. It needs to be this one time I was driving to work and I was listening to this random chick on a podcast talk about mood and something hit me like a lightning bolt and I made a decision that I would no longer be this person. It's in The Greatest Showman, arguably one of the best movies ever made. It's the song from now on. Y'all listen to that soundtrack, Mike. You know what? Some of you have listened to that soundtrack and maybe you need to go back today and you need to, maybe you need to pause this podcast and just go listen to from now on as loud as it can get in your car stereo and scream it at the top of your lungs. From now on, I mean Hugh Jackman. Come on, it's such a good song. The first thing that you do to change your mood is decide you're going to change your mood. I wish in life that it was as easy as just that decision. But what I want you to actually choose in this moment is not that you're going to change your mind. It's not that you're going to change your mood. It's that you are going to change your mind and your mood as many times as necessary to become the person you want to be. Because if you listen to part one, then you know we have practiced the behavior of this suffering state. We've practiced the behavior of these bad moods for decades, some of us. Your body is wired to do the same thing over and over when presented with stimulus that it recognizes as scary or wrong or it reminds us of our ex and because it reminds us of our ex then it makes us feel why and then we do these things. because We are wired for this. 
So you don't need to make a decision to change. You need to make a decision to change again and again and again. You're not making a decision to like flip a light switch on right now. You're making a decision to start walking down a path. And you're committing to continue to take steps forward down this path for as long as it takes you to get where you want to go. I have been working at this particular goal for five years. And I can tell you, I have never, I have never felt better. I have never felt more clear. I feel strong in my spirit. I've made the decision over the last year. I have cut out a lot of business partnerships. I have cut out friends and I'm using air quotes because like understanding that people weren't actually friends and like the decisions that I've made or the people that I've allowed to be around me that made me feel like crap or made me feel like I had to earn my right to be there or just like putting myself into these situations and I could see it like oh and I see I'm doing that here and I see I'm doing that here and I see I'm doing that there it's one little thing at a time and you're going to put this puzzle piece in here and then you're going to put this puzzle piece in here it starts to come together and I feel so good and I sometimes feel so good that I get scared that it's all going to go away I sometimes Like it feels so good and it doesn't feel perfect. Like, I mean, in the course of a week, I still have many moments where I want to like go in my bedroom and like flip off my kids with two, just both fingers, just double flip off at the door. They can't see me. They don't know I'm flipping them off. But like, that's what I want to do. That's the energy because, oh, the two youngest and they fight and I just, right? So I still have those moments a lot. But overall, I feel so good, just like energy wise and like my relationship with myself. And I catch thoughts all the time now, thoughts that would have like run rampant. I'm so much better at catching things and just being like, that's not, uh -uh, that's not who we are. That's not what we think. That's not what we do. I heard this expression once that like the first thought you think is how you were conditioned to think. And the second thought you have, the one that immediately follows it up, is who you really are. Like you see a woman walking down the street and you're like, oh, like who does she think she is? What's she wearing? That outfit's crazy. And then you're like, what? Oh my gosh. Like, why am I saying that? I don't care what another woman wears. Like, who am I to decide she can't wear a mini skirt? Like, she feels hot. Like, good for her. And then you sort of feel guilty because you even had the first thought. That first thought is like your conditioning. The second thought is who you are. Like, I still have to fight my way through second thoughts a lot like, oh, wait, no, this is who I want to be. But I feel really good. And it started with a decision. It started with a decision to choose this over and over and over again. So you make this decision. And then here's something that I believe is capital T truth. Like, I believe this is true for me. And I think that if it's true for you, it really helps. But I'm not trying to tell anybody else how to believe. But here's what I believe. I believe that our brain controls our body. But I believe that our our soul, our spirit, has the ability to control our brain. And you can't see me if you're not watching this on video, but um, when I'm pointing at my brain, I'm pointing at my head. And when I'm pointing at my spirit, I'm pointing at like my heart, my chest. That to me is, uh, is like our, our soul, our inner wisdom, our intuition. That is what I believe is actually who we are at our core. That is who we are without the world's conditioning. That is who we are before they told us who to be. That is who we actually are. And there's a lot of layers that exist between our brain and our intuition if we were never taught about those two things. Our intuition, that, that what I'm going to call our spirit, I believe our spirit is always calm, is always knowing, is always loving, is always kind to ourselves. I believe our spirit always knows the right answer. It knows where we're supposed to head next. It knows what we're supposed to do. And if we as human beings were acting from a place of spirit instead of a place of our brain, 
this would be a peaceful nirvana and we'd all be, you know, I don't know, hanging out with tigers or whatever. That <laughs> that didn't make sense. Uh, this would all be a peaceful nirvana and we'd be thriving. Every single human would be thriving. But unfortunately, that's not how it is. It's an important distinction for you to make, though, for you to understand that the brain and the spirit are two completely different things. The way that you know they're two completely different things is, have you ever done a meditation and they say to, uh, to quiet your mind and to just become aware of your thoughts? Um, in fact, you and I can do this right now. We don't even have to go into a deep meditation. If you're able to close your eyes, close your eyes. And if not, you could do it while you drive. Or maybe not. Maybe you shouldn't do this while you drive. But try it later. Allow your mind to empty. And then... I want you just to observe your thoughts. If your mind empties and you just observe your thoughts, just sit for a minute and catch one or two thoughts that float across your mind. So I'll tell you what popped into my head. I can see a flower dancing. Oh, look, the, the flower is sort of dancing in the wind outside the studio. It's very hot in here. I'm extremely hot recording this podcast but I don't want to turn the air on because it messes up the audio it's a cobweb over there in the corner these are some of the things that I observed while we were doing this now here's my question for you who observed the thoughts if you are your brain which most of us think we are if you are your brain then who observed the thoughts? Because if you are the thoughts, you couldn't have observed them. It's two completely different things. And there are teachers who are much wiser than I am who can teach you about your inner wisdom and your intuition, but it's enough that you understand that they're separate. And it's important that you understand that they're separate because your brain is not necessarily your friend. Your brain wants to keep you alive. And your brain will do whatever is necessary to keep you alive, even if it makes you miserable in the process. In part one of this series, I talked about the fight or flight response and how our brain is wired to respond to stimulus in certain ways. That is not your brain doing what is best for you listening to this podcast in 2024. That is what is best for your brain wired to an ancient civilization that was trying to keep you safe in case you had to go to battle with a woolly mammoth. Obviously, in a group, you wouldn't take on a woolly mammoth by yourself. My point is that if you can understand that your brain's trying to keep you alive and that your brain is wired into pattern have you ever heard that that thought that um neurons that fire together wire together when you create pathways in your brain when you think about something or when you think thoughts in a sequence your brain's like oh this is what sarah likes to think about whenever she sees dogs so i'm just going to wire these two thoughts together to make it faster for her right it's trying to make it as easy as possible for you to take in all of the information that you see if Sarah loves dogs, then every time she sees a dog, the neurons in her brain that are wired together are going to follow down the path of what she normally thinks and feels when she sees a dog. But if Sarah was bit by a dog when she was three years old and she thinks that all dogs are scary, then her brain's going to take a completely different path. And if she doesn't ever interrupt that pattern, her brain will keep thinking the same thoughts over and over and over. If you believe that your brain is who you are, then you think the thoughts are who you are. And the thoughts are often not telling you the truth. The thoughts are showing up in patterns that are pre-existing or through a lens of how you were raised or the society that you were part of or the religion that you grew up in. There are all sorts of filters that affect the way you think. So if you can understand 
that you have this inner knowing in you, this intuition, this inner being, this like who you are at your core, your soul, your spirit, and that that is not connected to the racing thoughts, then you can understand that there's separation and there's space and there's the chance to take a deep breath. You can also understand that your soul is infinitely more powerful than your brain. And that soul is what you need to tap into to calm your brain, to understand what is really true, and to guide your thoughts when they tend to go off in a direction you don't want them to. You've got to decide that you want to make this change. And I think if you can make that decision and you can understand this idea of your soul versus your mind, at least for me, it helped me to feel very empowered in making change. I mean, we just weren't real woo-woo. You knew I had to. I had to bring that in a little bit. My next piece of advice, though, is a bit more tactical. It's a bit more tactical, but it is taught by a teacher that is the woo-wooist of them all, and that is Esther Hicks teachings of Abraham. If you know, you know. If you don't know, start with Ask and It Is Given. It's a fantastic book. But if you've never read up on manifesting law of attraction, like if you've never done any spirituality studies, if you start with the teachings of Abraham, it might trip you out. But you know what? Maybe you need to be tripped out. Regardless of whether or not you decide to dive into those books or if you want to just stay right here with this thought, They have an incredible tool that you can use to change any mood. I mean, like so powerful, so fantastic. I actually heard about this tool from Gabby Bernstein in her book, Super Attractor, which is where I tell all people to start. If you like want to read a book about spirituality, but you're like, just want to dip your toe in the water, Super Attractor, I think is a fantastic way to go. So Gabby got this from Esther Hicks. I'm going to give it to you. Lots of people talk about it. But if you want to take a deeper dive, those are the teachers who are better equipped to help you with this. But Abraham, Esther Hicks, this idea is something that they call the emotional guidance system. Essentially, they teach that emotions are your indication of where you are vibrationally. That whatever you are feeling emotionally is telling you what level of vibration you're at. Is your energy great? Is your energy dim? Are you feeling something negative? Are you in those suffering emotions? And because you're suffering, like this is how you're feeling, it's an indication of where you at, where you are in terms of the energy that you can put out and also the energy that you call in. Why does this matter? If we just want to take a quick like dip into law of attraction and manifesting things into your life, the reason that it matters to know where you're at vibrationally, to know what you're putting out into the world is because the law of attraction says that we are attracting like with like, that you don't attract what you want, you attract what you are. So you might want a life that feels better. You might want to make more money. You might want to be able to send your kids to private school because the public schools in your neighborhood are really bad. You might want those things, but you are attracting more of the same because you stay at the same vibrational frequency. It's like tuning into a radio station. If you want to listen to 106.7, but you're at 93.1, you're not going to be able to access K-Rock, right? You're going to be accessing Jack FM when you want K-Rock. And those are two completely different things, but you can't access K-Rock on Jack FM's frequency. You tune to the level, you tune to the station, you tune to the vibration of what it is that you want to receive. Let's go back to mood for a second and understand that our emotions are an indication of where we are at vibrationally. And we're like, well, dang, I don't want to be, you know, at a vibration of level two because I'm only attracting people at level two. I want to, you know, I want a great partner. I want a great job. I want, you know, better friends. I want all of these things. Well, yeah, but you're, 
you want to be at the level of eagles, but you keep making decisions at the level of the pigeons. Pigeons can't fly at the level of an eagle, right? So you keep making decisions down here, you're never gonna be able to soar. I, I'm using every freaking analogy that I can to get this point across. So you're like, oh dang, okay. Well, that's another reason to change my mood because my mood is an indication of where I'm at vibrationally. So that's a thing, because if I'm in a bad mood all the time, I'm definitely not attracting anything good into my life, which just perpetuates my bad mood, and it's an endless cycle. So let's shake things up. Let's change. That'd be great if we could, again, flip a switch and jump from pissed off to euphoria. That'd be great. It'd be great if we could go from feeling really low and resentful to joyful and happy. It's not that easy. It's not easy to make a massive vibrational jump at any given moment. But what Esther Hicks and Abraham teach is that you can move up one level on the emotional scale. And then when you're at that new level, you can move up one level higher. And then when you're at that new level, you can move up one level higher. And it's like a ladder. You keep moving your way through the emotions until you get to an emotion that feels better than the one that you're at. I'm gonna pull up my Google. If you Google Abraham Hicks emotional guidance system, this will come up for you. But it is a list of emotions that go from one to 22. And one is like the great feeling emotions. Joy, appreciation, empowerment, freedom, love. 22 is the worst feeling emotions. Fear, grief, desperation, powerlessness, despair. Their idea is that you aim at an emotion that is higher on the scale than the one that you currently feel. So my favorite example of this when I was first learning about it is using anger to get out of grief, using anger to get out of fear or desperation. So fear, desperation, those are the lowest feeling emotions. Anger is number 17, whereas those lower emotions, those are number 22. But anger is something most people can easily tap into when they're in a situation where they're feeling fear, grief, desperation, despair. And this is a wild idea because I was never, ever taught that if you were trying to get out of these repetitive feelings that were so desperate and made you feel so sad and were just, you're drowning in suffering, no one ever said, find a reason to get pissed off. But if you and I think about it right now, if you think of times in your life where you felt so sad, so lost, so hopeless, so depressed... That has a certain energy signature, right? That feels a certain way in your body versus angry versus pissed off. Now, I'm not saying that being angry and pissed off is a good feeling emotion, but I think you and I can all agree it feels better than despair. It feels better than grief. It feels better than helplessness. Anger has energy to it. Ang anger is like, okay, I'm going to do something. There's some power in anger that doesn't exist in those lower feeling emotions. So if you're in one of those states and you can find something to reach for to turn the feeling into anger, it can get you out of despair. Now, this is a controversial idea because many of us were raised to be good girls and boys and good girls and boys do not get angry. And in fact, most of the people that you know and love, the people closest to you, they don't want you to be angry. Nobody wants to deal with your anger because if you think about it, when you're angry, that's often directed like other people can feel it. Even if you're keeping quiet, they can feel the anger emanating from you versus despair. They might not want you to be sad, but your despair, she's quiet. She's convenient. She's in a room. She's a little tiny thing. She's not hurting anybody. She's so helpless. And oh, you know, I can take care of her because she's despairing over there in the corner. But if she's angry... Well, then I have to deal with this angry version of my wife and I don't want to deal with that. So I'd rather 
that she feel sad. I'd rather she feel helpless because at least that's something that she internalizes versus externalizes. Do you see the difference? We're taught not to show this emotion because it doesn't feel good, but it freaking feels better than depression. It feels better than like, I'm so sad, I'm so sad, I'm so sad. I was talking to someone the other day who had been dumped by someone they really liked 10 years ago, 10 years ago. And she still, I could tell it was like trauma for her. She's still so wrapped up in it. She's so sad about it. She like, she feels all of these feelings about someone who dumped her 10 years ago. And I'm sure it sucked and it was hard and screw that guy. Cause he didn't know what a good thing he had. But I guarantee if my girl could turn that feeling into pissed off into like, you know what, screw this guy and just come up with like, you know what, he did it in such a crappy way. He could have broken up with me in a better way. And you know what, actually, this sucked. And you know what, also his hair was funny. And you know what, it doesn't matter what you use to sort of get you to that place because the anger can pull you out of lesser, like more suffering emotions. And if anger scares you, you, you know, jealousy, jealousy's higher up this level than fear, grief, desperation, despair, hatred, rage. Those are higher up this list than some discouragement higher up. And if the idea of reaching for emotions that feel negative to you is crazy, Understand that if you can get yourself there emotionally, well, guess what? There are some other emotions above that one that you're going to pull to next. So let's say you get to anger. Let's say you find a reason to be angry at your ex instead of sitting in a corner crying about the fact that they dumped you. And you're just like sitting in that anger. You're stewing in that anger for a minute. And you're like, okay, I felt my anger. I'm in my anger. And thank goodness I'm not feeling those other suffering emotions lower down the scale, it's time for me to reach for a better feeling emotion. Well, just above anger is blame. Anger 17, blame is 15. Well, could could we blame? Could we throw some blame around? Could we blame? <laughs> could we blame the brain? And you're like, wait, this doesn't make any sense. This sounds negative. This doesn't sound like spiritual or healing, because you're not going to stay in these emotional states. That's why people freak out when they hear this idea, because they're like, wait, you're telling me to reach for something else that's negative. As a, as a rung on the ladder to pull yourself out of despair. And the way that you reach for the next one, the way you reach higher up on the ladder is very simple. You think a different thought. You think a different thought. What's something else I could think about this thing I've already been thinking about for a decade? What's a different way to look at it? Is there a different way to look at this thing that would allow me to feel disappointment instead of anger? Right? So I've reached for something a little bit higher up. And then when I'm sitting at disappointment, yeah, I'm really disappointed that didn't work out the way that it I wanted it to, right? And then you're going to reach a little higher up. You're going to you're going to reach for uh you're going to reach for pessimism. You're going to be pessimistic because pessimism is higher up this scale than disappointment is. Can you see how pessimism might have a little bit more energy to it than disappointment? You know, pessimism's like, "Yep, yeah, see all guys are trash. I knew it. I knew guys are trash. I never should have tried." You're fe you're feeling pessimistic. And then, you know, a little bit higher up than from pessimism is boredom. You know what? I'm so freaking tired of swirling around and around this conversation about this random guy that I knew 10 years ago. I'm just bored. I'm bored with myself. I'm sick to death of thinking these same thoughts over and over. Okay, could we reach could we reach for a thought that can take us a little bit higher up on this ladder? How about hopeful? Hopeful. Wow, that, that feels a lot better. Is there something I could think? Is there a thought I could reach for that would help me feel hopeful? Could I get from boredom to hopeful? Yeah, I mean, I guess, like, I guess when I think about it, I'm pretty bored with these thoughts. But you know what? A month ago, I was down on the lowest end. I, I was drowning in grief. I was feeling despair. I felt totally powerless. And now I feel bored. 
that's a huge jump. So if I can jump that much in a month, then I guess I can feel pretty hopeful about maybe even moving further up this, you know, and then, oh my gosh, you accidentally just made your way without even trying to optimism. That's number five on the list. Feeling a little optimistic. Okay, you know what? Yeah, he was not great, but I've had a boyfriend before. I mean, we were together for three years and we had a lot of fun and, you know, I, I feel like I was a pretty good partner. And so like I've been it before, I could probably do it again, right? And, you know, I've met someone before and like I clean up pretty nice and I can feel, and then, you know what, that actually feels sort of positive and you keep moving up the ladder and you move up the ladder based on thought. And now that you know that your brain is not in charge, then the the intention set by your spirit that you want to feel better means you're going to force yourself to choose some thoughts that feel better than the ones you're swirling around and around inside of. I hope you guys will look this up. I've taught this to my kids. I've taught this. I've had teenagers over for dinner and like explain this idea to them. And everyone is always like blown away by this idea that you just work your way up the ladder of emotion until you get to things that feel better. So that's a really powerful tool to use. I said I was going to share six ideas with you, but I now realize if I share all six ideas, um, we're going to be here for six hours. So I'm going to share one more. (laughs) That's really good because I've already been talking for almost an hour and I see a way to use the other ones in an upcoming episode. So I promise I'm going to share those two because I'm going to do an episode about manifesting and I feel like these other ones really align with that super well. But the last piece of advice that I think can really help you. You've got your emotional guidance system. You've made the decision to change. You understand that you're going to have to make that decision over and over to see some real results. This is the last one. It's so simple. It's so helpful. And it's something that you get to decide to do. I learned this when I was, uh, I took a class a couple months ago about um, getting more in touch with your intuition. And it was something my teacher taught me in the class. And it's very simple. Look around you right now and ask yourself, what is the most beautiful thing that you can see? What's the most beautiful thing you can see around you right now? I have so many beautiful things around me. I mean, I could just, I could do a whole podcast on pictures of my kids and a painting I got at the art show and, um, this beautiful studio that I get to work inside of. But the thing that I keep noticing that I'm really appreciating today is just beyond the window of the studio, there's a piece of lavender, beautiful piece of lavender that just keeps dancing in front of the window. So it's not there and then you just see this purple like jump into the framing of the window and it's so sweet, it's sort of dancing in the wind. And I've been noticing it the whole time. But I do this a lot. I just look around me. What What's the most beautiful thing I can see? There's a picture that my daughter drew for me. And just here on the right-hand side is my brother's guitar. I keep it out here so that I'll practice when I'm not recording. And also, I just like having it near me. I think he would like that I have it near me. I see books that I've written. I see a Jane Fonda's mugshot because I think it's really inspiring. I see a poem someone wrote me once. I just... There's so many beautiful things around me. I could do this for ages. Appreciating what is right in front of you will change your mood in a way you can't even understand. If you bring this practice into every day, throughout your day, over and over again, when you find yourself in bad situations, when you uh, feel overwhelmed, if you can just focus in on like, what's the most beautiful thing that I can see right now? It's always there. And you learn to appreciate these tiny things. I told you at the beginning of this episode that I feel like I'm really good at embracing the simple pleasures of life. I like, I, I just snuggle down in the pleasures of my life. And they're not anything you could put on Instagram. You know, it's not anything... Fancy, it's, you know, my bed, oh my God, my, I am in a love affair with my bed. I have the most comfortable mattress on the planet. I just, oh, I love it. And 
I think a big reason I love it is because every night when I get in, I'm like, oh my God, I just so grateful for this bed and my home. Like I, I think like most of us, I'm like, oh, it would be, would it be cool to like have this or wouldn't it be cool to have a home that has that? And I'm just like, no freaking way. Like we have everything we need. This is beautiful. Like I'm so grateful for this home, just every part of it. You know, I, I went in the house to get an iced tea. I was like, ooh, I'm going to treat myself to an iced tea. And I went in the house to get an iced tea and I grabbed just a glass out of the cabinet. And then I was like, oh, I really want a mason jar. I want to have iced tea in a mason jar. It reminds me of like growing up and like having sweet tea. And it just made such a difference in my enjoyment of this iced tea that I took the time to put it in a glass I would prefer more. We just rush through this life. We rush through this life and we don't take very good care of ourselves. We don't honor ourselves. Like we get hungry and we don't eat. We're thirsty and we don't have time to drink water. We've had to pee for 45 minutes, but we're not going to the bathroom. We're tired, but we keep scrolling. We just keep going through every second, every day. You know, you're not nourishing yourself. And I I think it's because we're not taught to. And because we're not nourishing ourselves, it's really hard to feel good. It's really hard to have energy. It's hard to be at a higher vibration because our spirit is depleted. Our spirit's depleted because our body's depleted. We think we need these big answers, these, you know, grandiose ideas or these things that we have to buy or you know, if we could only take a two week vacation to Portofino and it's not, it's this moment. I found these like sparkly silver pants on clearance this weekend. I went to the movies with my teenagers and, uh, we stopped by Nordstrom real quick and I just was looking at their clearance rack and I found these like sparkly, if you can't see if you're not watching the video, but these like silver, I don't even know what kind of material this is. They're they're personality pants. They got a lot of personality. And I saw them and I was like, oh my gosh, I want to be the person that wears sparkly silver pants with high top neon sneakers and a sweatshirt. And y'all, here we are. I just, yeah. And I know in this example, I bought something. You don't need to buy anything. But like, I have worn these I bought, I got them like three days ago. I've worn them every day since then because I just, I'm like, OMG, I have sparkly silver pants. What a treat. We're just, we're just rushing through and we're rushing through because we're trying to get somewhere because we think that getting somewhere is going to make us happy. The decision to make yourself happy in this day with what you've got access to, that's what's going to make you happy. Because if you can't find that, where you are, you won't have it when you get where you want to go. You're in control of your mood because you're in control of everything. And it isn't easy if no one taught you how, but God, is it worth it? Five years ago, the most worldly success, the most financial success, I mean, everything from the outside looking in, I had it. And you could not pay me enough. There's, there's not enough money in the world to make me go back to that version of myself. Ugh. It's not the thing you're chasing that's going to make you feel better. It really isn't. It's you choosing to feel better. That's the hack. Yeah, those are my thoughts for today. <laughs> I hope you found this helpful, guys. I hope I said something today that really um, hit you where you needed to be hit. If you dug this episode, I would so appreciate if you would uh, share it with a friend that you think would find it helpful, too. We will be back soon with more conversation. And until then, as always, I love you and I'm rooting for you. 